Can anyone hear me? Yes. Anyone hearing it? Hello, yep. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> Mike, is that you? All right. Um, we're going to we'll, uh, um, start eight again once we get into the question and, uh, and answer session. We'll put you in a question queue so that we can uh, get the questions answered hopefully in order. It looks like we have Frank, um, possibly. Frank, are you here? Frank, are you here? Hi. Uh, Brian, is that you? Or is that Ted? No, it's me. Hi, Ted. Brian, Brian's going to, Brian Hutchinson on Massachusetts is going to try to get on, and uh, Paul will be on shortly. I was just okay. talking with him. Okay. Hi. Uh, hi, Frank. Hi, Ted. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone, and Frank will have to unmute you. Okay. So I need to get a, the line quiet, so hang on. Uh, Frank, is that you? Yes, that's me. Okay, great. All right, welcome, Frank. Uh, here we are at the University of Eucadia, ready to uh, go forward on another new night with a, some new information I believe you have for everyone. Uh, yes. So if you'd like to do a quick introduction and um, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Terry. You're welcome. Welcome to everyone who's on the call tonight. Uh, on Thursday, the 6th of January, 2011, also, welcome to those that will be downloading the call later on. Just uh, for everyone who is on the call and those that will be listening to the call, this is a regular call that we have every Thursday night at the same time, so that if you hear about this call or you listen to this call and you'd like to hear more, then this is something that we are doing every Thursday night with Eucadia, and in particular, the University of Eucadia website. And just for those that may not know the address, the address for the University of Eucadia site is uh, HTTP, the usual front, and then university.eucadia.info. That's university.eucadia.info. So tonight, there's a few things I want to cover. Uh, the Firstly, I'd like to thank everyone that continues to provide insights and information and help us in this model. UKDA is a model and as such it's something that is a collaborative effort. It's something that's constantly growing and our objective is to improve it. So I want to thank everyone that is providing in whether it be corrections for typos or suggestions and I encourage everyone to participate on the forums on universityukda.info and those that have sent in their emails. But with that, there's been some fantastic research and insights that have come recently since our last call, and I want to cover those. The first area I want to cover tonight is an issue of necessity, compliance, and under duress. And the reason I want to cover that area first is that I believe this is an area that unfortunately how we come to be here is an area that continues to trip us up in how to deal with hearing summonses, arrests, and, and how to conduct ourselves to give ourselves the maximum opportunity of success within their court system. The other area that I want to talk about is the updates to the ecclesiastical deed poll notes on the site and just run you through some of those important updates. I then want to cover with you some important updates to the canon laws. These are evolving meanings where we thought we knew, where we thought we had uncovered some of the practices, behaviours and deep hidden uh, realisations within, embedded within the law. 
uh, we are constantly finding more and more as the veil has now dropped that the what we thought, for example, title was is something slightly different. So I want to go through some of those canons with you in updates, and I'm sure you'll find them uh, very interesting. I then want to talk about another area, which is the area of credibility when you're speaking to people about big issues like the current system in the world being a system of slavery. And in fact, how you can prove that once and for all. How you can actually prove to people that we do in fact li live in a system of Roman slavery. And I want to thank the researchers over in the UK for some of the brilliant insights that have come through that. I want to also cover the issue of foreclosures. It's been on the list for some time and I'm sorry that we haven't raised it enough. I know that a number of you have foreclosure issues, home eviction issues, and I want to spend a bit of time on that. So depending upon how we go, we might have some more things to talk about, but I think those subjects being the concepts of necessity, compliance under duress, the updates to the ecclesiastical uh, instructions, the updates to the canons, this very important issue of understanding slavery and, and the proof that the system currently in the world is a global system of slavery and foreclosures, I think, is going to probably take us the, the better part of the, the next hour. And then I want to, as we've been doing on these calls, I want to ask that we have a, a good hour to answer your questions, concerns and issues. And as you are asking questions, I just ask that you can um, go, is it hash eight? I'll have to ask hash eight or star eight. I'll have to ask um, Terry that. But just to queue up your questions so that Terry can take those in order. And, and when it is time for questions, I know that many of you have phen phenomenal knowledge phenomenal knowledge, but I just ask in the hour, if it's possible, please, that you can reduce your um, questions to questions, and if you've got statements, then please use the forums on University of Eucadia, send uh, emails, but if you've got something where you want to make a statement, um, let's just take that on notice, otherwise we can get through all the questions. So let's start with this issue of necessity, compliance and under duress and exactly what I mean by this and why this is so important. If you think about your own existing problems and the problems that you've faced and the people that you know and you created a ledger in your mind of all the people that have lost their homes, gone to prison, been fined, uh, got into trouble versus those people that have succeeded then overwhelmingly the system is geared against us. And that's common sense, but I want you just to, to imagine those groups. The people you know who have succeeded and the people you know who have not yet um, really succeeded given the, the pain that they've gone through. And of course, it's a, it's a terribly unbalanced scale. Now I want you to consider the people that have suffered, including yourself, and think about this. In almost every case, if you think about it, in almost every case, there is a common thread between them all, whether it be a child, a uh, family issue, whether it be a mortgage, whether it be a debt, whether it be whatever it is, there is one theme that seems to pervade that. And it is the theme that we have been under the belief that if we don't comply, if we stand our ground, then we hold the moral right and that at the end of the day, whatever they do is unjust. Now, while that is noble, and I still have remembered virtually every few months that image of the man standing in front of the column of tanks in the Tiananmen Square uprising, let's have a look at the other side and see a common thread of those people that succeeded. And it turns out there is actually a common thread between the very few that have succeeded. And in, in many cases, what we find is that those people did not put themselves in dishonor in the system, no matter how mad the system is, no matter how evil the system is. They stayed in honor. They attended the hearing. So there was no arrest warrant for them. 
They were respectful for the judge, but they did something unmistakable. They made it known that they were there under duress as a matter of necessity and that their signature would be a matter of necessity under duress. And whilst they would comply, their compliance could not possibly be regarded as consent because they are under duress. Now, for whatever we do, this, I believe, is one of the most important issues we've raised in these calls in the last few weeks and is one that potentially has the biggest potential impact across the board if people are able to hear this message and, and understand why. Because what I've just said is that by staying in honour and understanding exactly the power of disavowing our oath, our vow, our, our signature, sign and seal under duress, under necessity, and giving them notice to that appears to be one of the simplest ways of finding remedy and one of the surefire ways of guaranteeing the system will bite on us hard is to get our back up and be defiant. So what's going on? Why is this important? And why does this seem to be such a overwhelming cry out there of people even more now than ever before saying, disobey, rise up, do not comply. What is going on? And why does the machine still seem to choke through? Well, for this, I'm going to ask you to, to jump onto a website. And the site I'm going to ask you to get onto is one-heaven.org, one-heaven.org. And what I'm going to ask you to do is when it comes up, uh, as it's coming up for me right now, is go to the area on the home page under Ecclesiastical Deed Poll and you'll see a section there that says Key Concepts. I want you to click on to Key Concepts because we're going to start to understand exactly what's going on and what we've, what we've been missing. Okay, I've got this in front now, so I'm going to use this as a reference as I go through. Now, I know it, it's hard for people over time as we talk about things like the courts changing form when the judge runs out and it's a recess and coming back in. And I've explained that, that in fact, the, the fact that a building had multiple types of court in it is a long-standing precedence. It didn't start last year or 100 years ago. That was something that was happening for hundreds of years. All that's happened is they no longer give us notice that the form of the court has changed. That's what's changed, is they no longer give us obvious notice. So it's not misery, it's not sorcery, it's not some urban myth, it's just that the system has continued to automate its uh, process. And another thing that I know that people have had trouble with is, is understanding this seeming paradox between the con constant promotion of common law claim, where we say common law doesn't exist, then trust law, and then, of course, uh, the laws that we know ourselves in terms of our, our vow and our oath. And the way to view that is you think of it as a layered cake. In this case, let's think of three layers of the cake. So the common law and commercial law is the, is the icing on the cake. It's not a very nice cake, but let's say it's the icing. Then the next layer down is trust. That's hidden from our view. That's the, the system by the clerks tapping away, adding numbers, creating bonds that we don't see and that they deny exist, flat stick. And then there's the base of the cake. Now, the base of the cake is Anglo-Saxon law. It is, in fact, common law. So common law does, in a sense, exist as the base, but not as you might think it does. The most important thing to them is your energy, and more particularly, your vocal energy, your vow and your oath. And here, we, we, you've probably heard this before, a man's oath is his bond. And this 
is a principle of the law, and it's expressed probably most commonly now under a...